I'm Dan Reed from 88.5 XPN, and I am thrilled to be here because the man I'm going to bring up right now is uh, a consummate performer. He is a Philadelphia original. This gentleman is a force of fucking nature. Please welcome warmly Mr. Ken Queter. Motherfuckers. <laughs> Let me tune up a second. I want to give you a show that's worth your money. Here. Thank you, Dan. Dan Reed from WXPN. Thank you very much, man. Thank you. Thank you. I, re I really appreciate that, man. Thank you, man. Now the fucking pressure's on. You know? By the way, this is my seventh night in a row. Last night I went on stage at 12.15 in the morning. And I think I have enough energy to go about three hours tonight. Fuck it all! In the last couple months I, I was getting pretty fucked up somewhere and I was thinking, man, I was, I was drinking but I thought it was somebody else drinking and then I thought I was going through some sort of really mysterious, mystical Zen experience. So then I thought, well, maybe I really was. And then I thought, what would I call that Zen experience? And I thought, you heard of Tao, T-A-O, what is that? It's a Zen thing, right, Tao? Then I thought, what about D-A-O, right? D-A-O? What's D-A-O? That would be like, drink as one. So I say, raise your glass, let's do a little Zen drinking. D-A-O, Tao. Drink as one, motherfuckers, now! <laughs> Ken 
Queter is one singer-songwriter who will keep trying as long as he can and as long as it's fun. Ken Queter and his secret kids are a new group from Philadelphia who say they sing pure rock and roll, but many of their critics feel it's a touch of punk rock and a touch of new wave. We went to the hot club to catch their act, and I asked Ken why it was that all of his fans say that he's the messiah and he's the best thing that's happened to rock and roll in a long time. This is what he answered me. I just think I was blessed with an understanding that uh, a lot of people aren't blessed with. I mean, certain people, like Einstein, was blessed with understanding of science. And I think I was, I was blessed with an understanding of uh, writing very good songs. I don't hang out with no broken hearts no more. When's the last time you looked at this stuff? I never look at it. Like, I just throw everything in the box. Um, and I don't know if it's a superstition or a phobia, but uh, uh, it's not like I'm trying to distance myself from it, but um, um, I, it's probably more of a voodoo thing, you know? Uh, um, I just don't do it. But I mean, it's kind of funny revisiting it, looking at some of these things. I remember, I remember everything, you know? I remember this guy. He was from, his name was Swifty, he's from um, England. We played together over in Copenhagen. That's me on a motorcycle. Then uh, did a, uh, that's the Secret Kids. Um, Johnny Sachs, Hank Ransom, Alan James, Chris Larkin, me, and Danny Sharon. Back in uh, 1978. Queter on the bicycle. Running from the law, there he is. This is down in uh, Barnegat Light. I was actually planting tomatoes with a total black rock and roll outfit on. That was not a good move. Queter on the telephone, constantly trying to book a gig, trying to stay busy. This, I rented this truck. It has 800 million candle power, can be seen from outer space. When I would do different CD release parties, I would rent a truck like that or several trucks that would uh, articulate the event to the point to uh, make it very dramatic because the, the, the lights would be scanning the skies, be like a big Hollywood opening. But uh, normally um, I would do this in Philadelphia, maybe J.C. Dobbs or outside the Tin Angel. The, the lights could be seen, if you were in outer space, you would be able to see the lights from like the moon. It was pretty amazing. This is in 1980 or 1981 and uh, I think I was trying to cop some cocaine there during that actual photograph. I was very intent on something and he was gonna help me out. <laughs> That's my mother, mother time, mine was. Without her, it would be no me because uh, half of what I do on stage is basically uh, trickled down from her behavior, which was very, uh, very, very dramatic and, and very poetic, which is great. Thank you. 
Okay, let's see, I have a million songs. I was either going to do a song called Places or a song called New Hampshire, which is a place, you know, or, uh, or a song called I Drink a Lot. Which one do we want to hear? I drink a lot. I drink a lot. It's a real short one, okay? Yeah. It's only four verses, so listen. And I didn't, in case you guys want to steal this song, I didn't copyright it because I don't believe in ownership. I don't believe in anybody should own anything. Because, you know, that would break my Marxist heart to, uh, to copyright anything. I drink. I drink a lot. I drink tequila. I've been known to drink a little scotch. I stand until I fall into an object. When I invite, I pick a fight. I drink and drive, but just at night. I drink and drive just at I want a schnapps, and I want it now. Don't fuck with me. You got it, pal. Yes, I drink. I drink a bunch. I drink for breakfast. There's a rumor going around that I drink for lunch. Um, I pray to God for a happy hour. When I'm hungover, I take a shower. My doctor said, that I would feel great if I could find it within my existence to quit drinking for about four seconds straight. Sometimes I think of what my doctor said, but then again, my doctor said, yes, I drink, therefore I am. I drink from boxes. I've been known to drink out of beer cans. I keep a bottle inside this guitar. If you drink with me, therefore you are. The Messiah. The Messiah. <laughs> If you're going to play the bar circuit where the bar owner mostly wants you to do cover songs and songs that people know, what you're actually doing is selling beer. I didn't know that he went to these places, these bars, and just did all these songs and took requests and just was sort of a running dialogue with the crowd. They had no idea he did all that. If I go out, I go see Kenny and all the little places, it, it just amazes me. All the guys that do the solo stuff, I don't know how the hell they do it, man. You know, get in there, get people, get people's attention, and keep that attention, and that's an amazing thing to watch. I think it works for Kenny because Kenny is a very special performer. Somebody like Kenny does not come down the pike very often, so you know you're seeing something special when you see Kenny. Ken Queter will not be denied. You know what I mean? He's not background noise. And I think that's why he keeps getting gigs at these places because, you know, I think the bar owners see that right away, that he's got this star quality about him. And I got a request for a Beatles song. I'm getting a lot of text requests, so. I got it. Okay. I have a request to go to the Franklin Institute tomorrow. I don't think I'm gonna make it though. Too many people in there, like rubbing elbows and shit. And there's no bar. Do they have a bar in the Franklin Institute? No. Do they? You have to have to get catering together. There's not a bar in the Franklin Institute that I know of. If I had my 
way I put a bar inside. Ah, it's a, I'll get you it a little bit later on. It's a Beatles song. Let's see. Um. Most people we know had to settle for something else along the way. He never really settled. If that means he has to sing other people's songs so that he can pay his bills, then you do what you have to do to make a living. He's still capable of turning on a full throat rock and roll eat me motherfucker show. And he's also capable of doing brunch in a old city cafe or a frat show at Smokey Joe's or a folk show at some coffee house. By the way, next week, is it next week? No, it's April. I'm doing it. I want everybody to know I'm announcing that Ken Queter's playing at a duck race. Show that to everybody. I'm doing a duck race. So if you guys want to come to the duck race, it's next Saturday at, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It's good to see everybody here on a Thursday in the summertime, man. It's good to see you guys. Thanks for coming out. If you all got any requests or something, I I'll try to get it. If I don't know it, I'll get it next week. So uh, even though we're closed, I'll still be here by myself getting the request. So. I'm going to make a request for myself because I have direct access and I'm a pretty agreeable kind of fella. I understand from the times that I've played with Kenny over the last 10 years or so, very rarely do you do any uh, original Ken Queter material. For the most part, it's the uh, uh, covers that um, most musicians have to play these days to make a living. Generally speaking, like the guy who's on stage now, it's not like a singular experience with the audience. The, kid, the people that come out the bars are generally under 35, and they grow up with a lot more distractions than I did when I grew up. Everybody who does what I do, or, or anybody who thinks they're good at anything, and they're gonna go in a room where they used to be the singular attraction, and all of a sudden, you're kinda sort of recognized or acknowledged, they could bother you, but like, I'm kinda guy like, I'll get your attention sooner or later throughout the night. Doctor, 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 what can I take? What can I take? He said, listen to me, Mr. Queener. My doctor said, listen to me. Mr. Queener, how long have I been fucking telling you? I told you the answers. You got to take some motherfucking heroin. Heroin, heroin, heroin. It's the only way. The only way. It's the only way. The only way.
way for me to get back to So every night's different, I read the audience. You know, if people are really asking me to do Ken Queter, I'll throw it in. But if people really want to hear Pink Floyd or Lady Gaga, Bob Dylan, Taylor Swift, Backstreet Boys, I have no, I, I enjoy doing that. You know, I'll do like a Woody Guthrie version of a Lady Gaga song. Ooh. I don't know any Nirvana. I'm more of a folk. Who, what'd you say, which one? Oh wow! I don't know any of that stuff. It's got to be a million songs for me to know it. Otherwise, I would pour. I would pour the the. Who? Woody Guthrie. Oh, Woody Guthrie! What a fraud he was. Woody Guthrie was might be literally, if you really get into it, might be the biggest fraud since uh, what's her Mother Teresa. Both those people were on the same level. Of, of, oh yeah! Oh yeah! Mother Teresa. Now let me tell you, Mother Teresa might be a bigger fraud than Woody Guthrie, but Woody Guthrie really was the big fraud. He accepted, you know. He was, he, was he was taking money on the side. You guys, did, you didn't do your homework, man. You got to do your homework, you know. Oh, we hear a train go by. It's very Woody Guthrie-ish. <laughs> Ken grew up in southwest Philly, very street-oriented, and a eccentric family life. My parents were uh, pretty dramatic people. Uh, my mother was really into Judy Garland. My father was really into Frank Sinatra. Every Friday night, there was, uh, you know, my folks would go out to dinner, and then um, they, uh, you know, doing like many, many martinis and Manhattans. That was the whole, whole point of it. There wasn't the dinner wasn't the point. It was the Manhattans and the uh, martinis and whatever else came along. And then, of course, they might run into some of my other relatives, and then they would all come back to the Queter household on a Friday night. The party would last Friday, Saturday, and then into Sunday morning. Uh, we were always fully stocked with scotch in the house. It was several bottles stacked in the Queter household. I had one uncle, my uncle Huey, he used to tell his wife he was going to church, but literally he was coming to my house in the morning uh, to get with the bottles of scotch. Those that have known Kenny for uh, many years will be familiar with Mother Time. Mother Time was the nickname that we gave to Kenny's mother, Nancy. My mother was really the genesis of the um, decision, a life decision, mm -hmm. when you're like seven years old and go and, and, and perceive that most things out there don't make any sense. But one thing that makes sense is that you love something and it makes you feel good and it makes you do things. It was my mother's love of Judy Garland and then I fell in love with, with the Judy Garland mystique and the, the whole theater of it all, you know. And I watched my mother sort of be Judy Garland. My father thought he was Frank Sinatra. So you had like Judy Garland and Sinatra as your parents. So, you, what choice did I have, you know? She could have probably been a great actress. I mean, in a way or a weird way, I mean, if it wasn't for her, I probably, she definitely was crucial in me selecting the field of entertainment because many times she felt that uh, if she hadn't chosen the life of being a wife and a mother, that she would have gladly been in the entertainment field. And I think she felt some sort of Personally, my opinion is I felt that uh, from hearing her mention this many times that she had deep regrets that she did not enter the, the entertainment field and become an actress and a singer. And then she told me how frustrated she was that she didn't continue with her life to be a performer. And I said, you know what? I could feel the pain as an 11 year old child. And I go, you know what? Life is pretty crazy. She sounded like she missed out on something. I'm gonna follow through on it. All right, man, my fingers are starting to hurt after a long day today, you know? Ken Queter hurts, you know? I, I, I take an, I just did. The fraternity gig was out of control. I was doing some chest bumping. You know what chest bumping is? When people jump and they chest each other. Except I didn't jump, I, it went right in my neck. Like the guy's chest went in my neck. It's like an athlete, when an athlete's chest goes into your neck and you're like a couple years older, like four decades older, it hurts. <laughs> A couple years older, only four decades. 
It's more like a couple decades. Even, it's even beyond a couple decades, actually. But I refused to allow him to know that I was injured, you know. Growing up in that period, the late 60s, we all kind of felt that there was this sort of pervading dream of hope and change, that through music and art, we had the potential to change the world. I mean, we really believed this. I would play like right here, and it would get really crowded. It would get really crowded. It would just be full of people watching me play. And then the police would come. I mean, it'd be like 100 people just, because I was really s singing, you know? And, and by the time I was like 18 and a half, and I used to draw big crowds around here, and the police would come and um, break them up, you know, and threaten to arrest the people, including me, you know? The crowd that was here, they were all like, you know, what you read about in the books about people being socially conscious and all that, they were all here and I was singing like these socially conscious songs, you know. It was pretty cool, it was kind of like, it was a really like um, aroma of hope in the air. Yeah, a lot of us would play like on these walls, you know. And we people would just show up with harmonicas and uh, tambourines. And we'd just be a big crowd here playing, jamming with me. Um, and, uh, you know, all over at different parts, different points of the wall, you know. And uh, like I said, it was always, a lot of people smoking pot. It was fucking great. It was outdoors, you know. This is a song that I used to play when I was down there, like back in, back in those days. This was definitely a song up there, because this was one of the first songs I wrote. Well, Park, you got me good? Well, Park Avenue never felt so good. Doing the things I've always wished my life I could. Singing my songs, the songs I've always known I should. And Park Avenue never felt so good. A worn out smile and a pair of busted sneaks. I scrambled around with my guitar in my stubborn cheeks. The rundown cafes I played paid me pennies but caused me pain. Back alley kisses Tasted like rain Well it all seems like a dream A trip on a one-way track My living comes easy And I swear I'll never go back There was a significant thing that took place um, in 1970, when I met a guy named Billy Scheid, I met him totally by mistake. I was walking up the street, and um, one of the guys that I knew from the basketball court was walking around, and he goes, you're a dude who played the guitar. You played the guitar. I go, yeah, I played the guitar. He goes, there's this guy, you know, up on 58th Street. He's, uh, uh, he can't tune his guitar. Anyway, I walk into this room, and there's this guy, Billy Scheid, who was like 27 at the time, and to me, that was really kind of old, and uh, he had obviously been drinking, and I, t I grabbed the guitar and tuned it like that. I mean, you know, he goes, oh, wow, thanks, man. Like, like, was a, like I'd solved every problem in the world, you know, for him. <laughs> so he started playing the guitar, and I played the guitar, you know, and then uh, at some point, you know, I've, we exchanged phone numbers, you know. Uh, but little did I know that, you know, I had no idea that that was gonna open up another world uh, by meeting this Bill Scheid guy. At some point, I think he called me. I didn't even call him, you know. So I had the number, but he called me. He said, hey man, why don't you come over, you know, and, uh, you know, bring your guitar, maybe we can pull jam. I was like, wow, man, holy fuck. Another guy within a mile of me plays guitar in my neighborhood. And he would just play that guitar and I would just play along, you know. But you could never get him to leave the house to play that guitar. He would only play in his fucking kitchen, you know. It was a, I mean, it wasn't until years later I got him out a couple of times, but he really wasn't in the leave in that kitchen. I'm going to my friend. He's a big shot here. Yeah, Billy. Come on.
is your friend. So am I. Remember us. We live together. Like as time unfolded, I realized not only does this guy write good songs, this motherfucker has an unbelievable aura about him in terms of being a performer. I mean, this ain't just some guy that I'm playing with in Rittenhouse Square and Temple or really good. This motherfucker is like powerful psychically. You know, like when you're at the table, we always played at his kitchen table. He would have people coming over, firemen, police officers, you know. I mean, he'd be lighting up joints. I'm like, what the fuck? The cops, the priest coming in, getting high, you know. You know, it, like, it was like about them fucking movies. And that, but then he would be playing these songs and they were great, so I, I became sort of like his sidekick, and I would like learn those songs religiously. I would go home and learn, and the next time I saw him, I would had his songs down perfect. Ken does channel Billy in performing. Ken has championed Billy's songs and always, always credits him, introduces the songs as Billy's. I'm gonna, I'm gonna play a song by a friend of mine who taught me how to write songs. He was a very good songwriter. I think his name. His name was Billy, so I'm gonna do this for you guys. It's a beautiful song. It's called Remember Me, and it's a beautiful song. I'm gonna do a song written by a friend of mine from Southwest Philadelphia a long time ago, Mr. Billy Shy. It's a beautiful song. Here's, here's another song by Billy Shy. It's a, because we recorded this together. It's a song written by a friend of mine. It's called uh, What a Waste of Flowers. It's really beautiful. It's like, this is by Billy Shy. It's a Billy Shy song. Billy Shy taught me how to write songs, so give it up to Billy Shy, motherfucker. I'm gonna, do a, I'm gonna do a song by my friend Billy Shied, which I, I've, not, I've never done, really don't do this song. All right, this is a Billy Shied song. Like everybody's probably first, you know, introduction to Ken was the posters. You couldn't live in Philly and not know Ken's name because of all the posters that were up. I started to put together Ken Queter posters. I was like going, fuck, I love Bill, I think he's great, but I got to do my thing. I'm getting a lot of confidence here. So I started to design this one poster called Ken Queter Folk. And by that time, I had already written just a couple songs. Kenny had created something that no one had ever seen before, which was his postering campaign. Ken Queter was a presence in the city before anyone knew who the hell, what the hell, Ken Queter was. He would just slap these posters up all over the city to the point where, you know, others and I as well thought, well, you know, who is this Ken Queter guy or Queter is what most people thought it said. There's nothing more good than aggravating people with a nice picture of Lee Harvey Oswald getting shot on a Monday morning on your way to work with a horrible hangover and you don't want to go to work and you see this fucking thing of, what the fuck is that? That's what the whole point was. You know? That's the way it used to be back in the day. You know, now you get a $200 ticket, you put up the poster in the wrong place. As much as we put those fuckers up, there was a beauty of anonymity, you know, because you could sort of, you, you felt like you were invisible because nobody, no, first of all, nobody would have been doing it yet. But one thing for sure, when they saw those photos of Lee Harvey Oswald attached to my name, getting shot in the stomach by uh, Jack Ruby, that picture was still in people's psyches from nine years prior or 10 years prior from television when the Kennedy assassination happened. And that was one of the, to me, was really one of the most ta first tabloidal posters ever to be put up anywhere in any major city in the country. I mean, no, people normally put up like 
nice pictures or whatever. I put up the fucking deal. Lee Harvey Oswald getting shot, you know, with my name. And I wanted people to remember my name. And if anybody had the nerve to take ours down, we went and put them back up. Because I didn't look at it as like a six month uh, uh, investment. I looked at this as year in, year out, year in, year out, year in, year out, year in, year out. Ken Queter, Ken Queter. And someday, maybe by 1977, you'll recognize the name. She's home in LA. Like after a while, if you had like 3,000 posters up, we go, what's next? Well, I guess we have to put together a band now, right? Most bands create a band, then they get a publicity machine. We had a publicity machine which preceded the band. By the time we did our first rock show, the original Secret Kids, we are talking about four to 5,000 posters glued everywhere. It was a very exciting time, but also a lot of what was going on um, uh, at that time was right before punk music came in. And so there were, it was kind of a, a large change in the air at that point. Because nobody was doing what we were doing at that time, you know. That was a, people called it punk or pre-punk or whatever. It had nothing to do with punk. It was just me imitating my mother on a Friday night. You know, it was like more of a family affair on the stage. I remember going to his mother's house in Southwest Philly to listen to his band. He was doing something that really deserved to be heard by more people. We would go into bars. Most bars say, nah, I'm not going to hire you. Hire. Then we would do bars and we'd go, look, we're doing an original show. They're like, what the fuck? You're like, what the fuck is it? We have a jukebox. Like, they, they couldn't figure out. But when we would go in, you know, it wasn't that many bars. All of a sudden, we were selling them out. Everywhere we played, we broke the liquor sale record. So when other bars heard about that, they go, wow, maybe we should do original music here one day a week or two days a week. And so it spread out. So there were other clubs took chances. Nowadays, there's a lot of venues, and there's people that can play music and people that can't play music. I can't imagine being a musician back then and literally having nowhere to play. When you went to see the Secret Kids, it was like, you know, wow, this is like some kind of fucking, almost like a pep rally or something with poetry. And, you know, I mean, he was kind of a daredevil, especially in those, you know, in the early days. I mean, that was another thing, you know. So, you know, again, you just, people would be there just to see what was going to happen. And then they became part of the, you know, they joined the club. Kenny shows with the uh, Secret Kids were usually ultimately monuments to complete and total chaos. If you uh, went to a Secret Kids show, it was inevitable that at some point pandemonium would totally break out. We booked the tavern several times, and then we booked some colleges, and then of course we booked uh, the Ethical Society down in Rittenhouse Square. Uh, the Ethical Society was a fairly large venue, ev even by today's standards. Now that was a real place. Bob Dylan had played there, Leonard Cohen. All these people had at some point played the Ethical Society. Plus it had a reputation of being a place where people would go and uh, have conversations and discussions of a pretty high lofty ideals and ideas. I don't think they quite knew what they were uh, letting themselves in for. Kenny's shows during the mid 70s were just totally crazy. There was a, a certain aggressiveness and a certain hostility going on as if he was always challenging the audience to uh, get in a fight or an argument. Well, we went in with the band. They didn't even know who, what we were doing. Uh, but we went in, gave them the impression that we were going to sell some tickets. Well, we pretty much sold it out. The audience was, uh, uh, a lot of them were friends, but a lot of them were people that just came in. Since we had pretty much swamped Philadelphia with Ken Queter posters at that time, a lot of uh, the local residents were interested in what it was all about. A lot of people showed up with, like, cases and cases of beer. Like, they were... People took cabs and were showing up with like 20 quarts of beer, you know. So it was probably 
the drunkest audience of all time at the Philadelphia Ethical Society. And then one guy on stage was on stage and he, uh, he decided to play saxophone to one of our songs, right? One of our songs. But I didn't know that that saxophone may have been involved in some sort of a heist, a burglary, right? I had no idea. I just thought this guy was a saxophone player. And he starts playing, and somebody in the audience who really was drinking a lot, who had been burglarized two months before, who looked at the sax and realized that sax used to be in his bedroom, but now it was on the stage of the Ethical Society, right? And he decided to take the law in his hands and go on stage during a performance while this motherfucker is playing a saxophone and slug this guy while the sax was in his face, like, you know, basically broke his tooth. And then all of a sudden, all hell broke loose on stage. We looked up towards the back of the auditorium, and what do we see but three or four Philadelphia finest uh, silhouetted against the uh, lights from the lobby. So like 10 squad cars were brought to the Philadelphia Ethical Society, the place surrounded, you know. <laughs> and uh, it, the show was ended, you know, and they'd already taken people. <laughs> and who the fuck was a ringleader? Me, you know. So, I, you know, and you know what happened? A year later, I rented it out again. I got fucking got back to it. I couldn't believe it. They forgave me. Secret Kids were, without a doubt, one of the best fucking bands the city has ever had. Queter's live shows were amazingly dynamic. You know, he was out of his mind, really. <laughs> it was un unstoppable music. And Queter was completely out of control. Denny, uh, Denny upstairs, Denny Sheraton, told me that the Secret Kids are in their third generation. Fourth. Fourth generation now. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me about the other generations, starting with the first, which... Well, one, gen one generation, um, I know I, well, one generation was with um, bifocals, the second generation had bifocals, the third said fuck the bifocals, and the fourth said you were And the fourth them. was bifocals are important, yet you need a subsidiary for the bifocals. That's not good. That's, that's true. <laughs> I believe you, believe it or not. <laughs> well, I, I don't understand you. it, but I believe you. It means, in other words, we don't need no leader, we need a leader, and then we need a super leader. You know? Fuck the fucking leader. So, which means, we're gonna break up the, uh, the band. That's why there's a brand new band. We broke up the band. We didn't believe in the fucking bifocals. Define bifocals. A bifocal is someone who can play a good guitar. Uh, well, well, most of the you know crazy queer stories usually just uh, it revolve around drinking. In his mind, I assume, in his in his body, the alcohol stimulates a uh, you know a part of his brain where. Crazy things happen. Some of them turn out to be incredibly entertaining and creative, and others are just perceived as Kenny's being Kenny. I was really hooked in with like Jim Morrison, Judy Garland, cats like that, that were really emotional at what they did. I felt that I should be able to get away with everything that they got away with, except I forgot they had really good booking agents. It's the same thing with like putting Lee Harvey Oswald's picture on the posters. I knew my music was great way back then, but I needed to get people's attention. So if I climb up on a ladder and take lights out and throw them into the audience, or if I come out with a, a 357 Magnum and I put it to my head, in these like conservative clubs that were called the cabarets, I just figured people would get it. You know, things like falling asleep in the backseat of an unmarked police car, those things happened, because I used to go into cars when it was raining and fall asleep just to sleep it off from being drunk. And then when, by the time I woke up, it would stop raining, I'd just get out of the car. I thought that wasn't that outrageous. But at the same time, I didn't really see any problem with that because my major thing is I didn't have a publicist and I thought this can only solidify 
my name somewhere because I've always been a believer that there is no such thing as bad publicity as long as they spell your name correctly. I mean, it, there was some really fun, and especially in the beginning, because it was all like, you know, it, things were just firing on all cylinders, and you know, the band was tight, and uh, Ken would just like, you never knew what he was gonna do. You can just get a room uh, of people excited to be alive, you know, <laughs> through music and through words and through humor. The thing is, I've always believed that you have to do, what you do on stage has to be so outrageous. First of all, I knew my music was great. There was never a doubt in my mind that I, my music was great. good musicians and, and he had the songs and he was always very in, intense about delivering his songs. Everywhere we played sold out and then all of a sudden we were in the studio recording. Man in the Moon, take one. We went into the studio, we cut a single, Man on the Moon and Susie Said So. And in those days, the radio stations would play local bands. And once that single got on the radio, and you could, I could walk down South Street and hear it on the radio, NMR or IOQ, that's when things really took off. Now don't be afraid of the man on the moon. He's only stuck. By October of 1977, two months after those recordings and those songs were mixed, we were getting radio, regular radio airplay on the big radio stations. All of a sudden, I mean, from like late 76 to late 77, every journalist, in this, I was talking to every journalist in the city about something. So that the reputa my reputation and the band's reputation just got bigger and bigger and bigger. For a good, I don't know, year and a couple of months, we, everywhere we played started to sell out. A lot of people in, in our age bracket came out to the Secret Kids shows, you know, like the 20-somethings. The it was just kind of like a party. <laughs> On stage, off stage. The band was really, you know, we were just getting better and better and selling out. You know, there was just a whole lot of uh, momentum going with us. Kenny really wanted to make it. The energy that he had just is what you need. You need ambition, you need desire, and he had all of that. Everybody I guess, was hyped we were going to get a record deal because Aris had already signed another band called the A's that were in Philly. So, you know, we figured we were next in line. You know, we, we pretty much had done everything you could probably do in Philly. By then, of course, I was developing a God complex, which, you know, was kind of the normal thing to do for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I, you know, you just think about I'm going to be the next guy. I'm going to show you the building that I was in, the big famous Clive Davis meeting right here. We're going to 
We're going to park right here. It's right. And I swear to God, I'm not even thinking about driving. We're being driven here right now. It's called Ten Stone. That used to be called right there. That was called the Hot Club. And that's where Clive Davis came to see me and the Secret Kids. Right there. We were doing a show at the Hot Club, and we had Clive Davis, who was the head of Arista at the time, come down to see us, which was a huge deal. It was like, you know, February is freezing. He comes in, he's got a fur coat and a tan. Back then, you had these guys like Clive Davis who would swoop in and give you a record contract and perhaps make you a rock star. I mean, he had the ability, the ways and means to make your dreams come true. If you were signed as a singer-songwriter, the caveat with that is you were the next Bob Dylan. Well, the story I first heard was that Clive Davis comes to Philly, loves Ken Queter uh, and his band, wants to sign him, but says he wants Queter to do this, 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 and this. Queter gets drunk, tells Clive Davis to fuck off. From what I heard, Ken shows up totally blitzed. The band was going to get signed. He loved the band. He wanted to hear one song that would break across the country. Uh, barely gets on stage, and when he does get on stage, continues stopping songs and um, saying things like, you know, you're never going to, you're never going to, you, you think you can own Ken Queter, you're not going to own Qu Ken Queter, you know, the typical, don't you know who I am? And uh, Johnny's saying, oh my God, no, oh my God, no, oh really? You're not really saying that, are you? These people here think they're going to own me, they're never going to own me. And Queter told him to go fuck himself, he just heard the best songs over here, that's it. The story was he totally, you know, he told him to go to hell, go fuck himself. My suspicion is they also wanted him to clean up his act and, you know, not scream motherfucker at this audience all the time and things like that. And I finally got to the bottom of it. It's not quite as dramatic as you heard. People have a more romantic version of Kenny getting upset and storming out and all, and it wasn't quite like that. It was a great show. The crowd went crazy. Kenny was on his game. There was no complaint. You, could, you couldn't criticize what you saw physically. I was the only band member that went to a meeting after the show with Ken and his manager, Bill Ive, and we went to a bar up the street called Doobies. It was just a conversation, and Kenny wasn't satisfied with Clyde Davis's particular definition of who Kenny was and what Kenny needed to do in order to succeed. It was another point of view that Kenny had never experienced before, one coming from a man who worked with Bob Dylan and, uh, and Bruce Springsteen and many other great artists. It was just a, I believe he took it as a disappointment to hear Clive Davis say, you, you need a signature song, and Kenny felt that every song he wrote was a piece of genius, and an artist has to feel that way about their art. I was asked to, um write songs on a simple uh, level so that the people, I'll never forget, the people in Iowa, Iowa will understand it. I'm like, who the fuck are they, you know? I mean, like, I mean, like nothing against them, but what are you talking about? Well, why don't you just make sure there's less syllable? They're always giving me to use less syllables in my words and stuff. I go, why? They go, well, then you could sell more hit records if your song's hit. And I'm like, going, yeah, but then, it wouldn't be my song. I would be writing like someone else. I was like, like, what if it doesn't become a hit? You know, is there a guarantee if I do that, it's going to become a hit? And they're like, no. And I go like, then why the fuck would I do that? They sign you and they give you money and their objective is to sell records and they need to have you 100% on board with them and feeling the same way they do and be willing to do what it takes to succeed. You write a great song. It might become a great hit. If it doesn't, it's still a fucking great song, and I fucking wrote it. You know, that's the truth. You know, so, I mean, like that's my thing. You know. I think it was after that that maybe things started to loosen up a little bit. You know, maybe people were, you know, not really uh, as psyched. It, it's it's hard to remember, but we still worked. You know, so, but it's hard to remember the really the straw that broke the camel's back about you know the band the band splitting up. You know, because when we were gigging, although we were selling out, we might have been making 25 bucks a gig or 15 or maybe 40. And if we got paid a thousand bucks, 750 bucks went into roadies and the staging, uh, you know. So then it was only like 250 to go around. You know, if that, that would be a good night. We actually made Six dollars, six dollars, and we got a dollar twenty each, man. <laughs> Ken was actually handing out the dimes. <laughs> and everybody was really broke. I mean, people lived in poverty. I mean, like, you know, poverty can be romantic when you're in your 20s. When you approach 30 and you get in your 30s, it's not exactly romantic. You don't go into music to uh, really make a fortune out of it. If you do, you'll be uh, sorely disappointed. 
I wasn't going to stop. I didn't give a fuck about poverty. I was like, you know, I'll just keep doing this. The very first band I had was Wasted Lunch. You know, that was before The Secret Kids. Uh, then I was in a band called Omega. And then after that, The Secret Kids. And there was three different generations of that. Then after that was the men from Queter, Ken Queter and his Radio Church of God, Ken Queter and the men from Povich, Ken Queter um, and his greedy little miser weasels. That was a good band. Ken Queter and the Indian Guides, Ken Queter and his enablers featuring the codependents, also featuring the sexolettes. Included within the sex that's were the Couch Dancers. That's one band. Ken Queter and then the Employees. Several other bands I can't remember. Ken Queter and the Men from Wawa. Uh, then before that was Ken Queter and, and the Way and, and the Way Back Machine Men. That was a good one. I just felt that I was. To, this was my meaning. This is what I had determined. This this is what I was meant to do. I made no money, you know, but I didn't care because I just thought, fuck it. This is what I do. I had my shot. When I was young I'll never know what I'd done wrong What good Would it do for me now I could say that I'm fulfilled That I live on the top of a hill In a house With purple fields Oh, that way right before the end you know he would get about six months after that when was that that was in um october of 1988 no no 87 because he would die on may 2nd 1988. did he play a lot never played never came out of his fucking house it was insane like I was, I'm, I'm the one that got that show for him, mm -hmm. you know? And with the thing, that video of him with the band playing behind him, that was the show, the end of, that was, that was October 25th, 1987. That was Van Morrison's drummer with him, you know? Oh, wow, really? Yeah, no kidding. But you know what? Sometimes I feel like, I'm, like I pulled him out of his, he would never come out of his fucking kitchen. It's in there. I got him to come out on stage. You know, like going, did I have, did I have anything to do with this? You know, it was like a big deal for it, like taking a guy out of like seclusion. But you know, if you looked at, he looks like he's having a good time. Yeah. He had done a case of beer every day yes. on top of cirrhosis for yeah. 10 years. You know? What's happening? What's going on here? Where did he come from? Who, am I, who is this man? Who is that? <laughs> What's this guy? Hey! <laughs> Kenny Queter! I don't believe it! Oh, man. This is my favorite man in the world. 
This is the greatest, greatest man in the world. I'm telling you. Uh, can you, do you have time to sing a song? I was just pay, walking down Quint Street. I heard all this noise. I, I'm not really? sure, man. I, it's only a few. Do, do you have a time, you know, just to just do one or two tunes? You know? I, I was, I'm going to rehearse with Chris Larkin. I, I, don't, I think I've heard it No, wait, wait, wait. Come on. No, really. Sure. Seriously. Yeah, come on. Um, just do, just but do. But Chris, Chris really has a thing. Just do a half a song. Chris and I have this thing, you know. It gives a back. half a song. Chris Larkin. I'll give you ten dollars. Right. I'll give you five dollars. Right. I'll, I'll give you a hundred dollars. Just do one half of a song. All right, I'll do something about something. All right. All right. Hey, All man. Right. All right. Yeah, don't be shy, man. Yeah, yeah. man. I, it's so good to see you, man. I haven't seen you in 10, 15, I don't know how many years. <laughs> Me either, man, but it feels good to be in heaven. I'm telling you, baby. Typical of these guys that they just, I guess, almost like any writer, they just, they had these habits you know, of intoxication, you know, and because I had experienced that when we were playing and rehearsing and they, uh, he got pretty tuned up. No matter what time I went over to, to Bill's apartment, whether it was 10 o'clock at night or 10 o'clock in the morning, I could count on three things. He would always have a cigarette lit. He usually had a joint lit at the same time. And there was either a bottle of beer or a half-empty shot glass in front of them. Billy Shaw died, from what I would understand, as uh, direct complications of cirrhosis of the liver. He died from the same thing that killed Jack Kerouac, which is that he drank so much that he developed varicose veins on his, his esophagus, which sooner or later, your varicose veins will erupt, and then you'll choke on your own blood, which happens pretty commonly to um, people who drink a lot steadily, like big time, you know. It's sad because I know that he could have written many more good tunes. This motherfucker was the real deal. The people talk about muddy waters and shit. Where's it going? Can you put it in on it? I can't even see. There's something else, there's something in there. I have to knock it out first. Put the bell in. This song? Yeah, you played a bunch back in um, summer. This is Chucky from Kentucky. Like, in other words, this isn't Billy yet. He wrote this with Chucky. Then he goes this. Billy. Pencil. This is Billy here. Wrote a name. That's his voice. It's incredible. So, where was this like recorded? This... At home. Really? It sounds really good. Man. It's all fucking. Everybody's high. Was... You must have been too fucking small. Come on. Bum, bum. To remember the champagne. What a great voice, huh? Lamp, 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 lamp. Should have seen her reaction.
I was trying to tell somebody the other night at Smokey Joe's about my speech. I don't even know how they, 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 they invited me to come in and speak about what it is that I do, you know. And then, you know, because they thought it'd be an unusual angle. And I went into Wharton School to speak about uh, what it is that I do. And, um, and then, certain, you know, predictably someone asked a question about, you know, well, you know, do you make a decent living doing what you do? And I was like, well, I, you know, I, I, not really, you know, I, I just do it, you know, make some money. I, I don't really concern myself with money, you know. And, um, and they, they were like kind of in disbelief, you know, so, but they were explaining, well, how can you do it? I was like, well, because I'm like irrationally attached to what it is that I do. I mean, 17 straight years, I did nothing but original music. I was like living in poverty in one sense of the word, but living a very rich life in another way because the experiences that I had for a good decade out of the 17 were loaded with like exciting scenarios. Making a living off music is, is very, very difficult. It's a hard job. It's a very, very hard job. I mean, you're walking around constantly with your skin inside out and every slightest breeze is painful. Slightest criticism is you know, somebody might as well be driving a nail into your head. It's it's really, it's, it's, it's a tough gig. It takes a lot out of a person to try to have a musical career. Some people, the music is within them and they have to be a musician. And that's where I think, you know, Ken Quita falls in, into that um, category of people. This is what I do. He had mostly done original music with occasional cover songs here and there. But I think he, at that point in his career, he decided he, you know, he wasn't gonna make a living playing Ken Queter music the rest of his life. And there was this whole scene out there where he could play you know, Jimmy Buffett, he could play Pearl Jam, he could play Bob Dylan, he could play Johnny Cash, and people would pay him good money to do that. I should learn that song, that's a good song. Hard to remember those lyrics though, man. It was, you just uh, yeah, I was kind of skimming through them. What album's that from? That's from like... Sticky Fingers. Is that Sticky Fingers? Okay, wow. Yeah. Yes, hi, how you doing, man? He knew that there were a lot of people who were going to be disappointed, um, surprised, confused that he was doing cover music, because to them he was always Ken Queter, the artist, the rock and roll star. And he very consciously wanted to get away from being that and doing that. Uh, doing cover music, um, there's ways, you know, you can try to bring your own thing to a little bit, put your own, you don't have to change it that much, but you can, your, your personality can, can come through, even if you're doing a, a pretty um, verbatim version of somebody's song, you know? He got to a point where he would draw a line that he did not want to play originals and actually would start getting mad that people would ask for originals. I, I think he wanted them to understand what he was trying to do, understand the, uh, the irony, understand the, um, the fact that he just wanted to entertain people. And he wanted his, his audience and his fans to appreciate that and appreciate the fact that he had to make a living. You know, it's, it's very nice to be a, a, a tortured artist but you have to make a living somehow. It's hard because when you're trying to make a living doing music, unless you have a hit record or you're like a million selling artist or, you, or something you had went viral on YouTube or whatever, you don't get a chance to put that stuff out there. Music doesn't mean much to people anymore. People don't really sit down and listen to music. They don't sit down and listen to an album. I mean, an album is still, even if it's a CD or whatever you want to put it out as or a download. People don't sit and listen to the whole thing. We used to do that, we used to experience that and turn other people onto it. I see a lot of people that just do cover music and um, they're very good at it and they make a living doing it. Even though the audience isn't totally paying attention to them, they eke out an existence doing that because it's hard work when you're playing your heart out with songs that you're playing very well and, and the people aren't necessarily giving you 100% attention. Let's face it. I don't think anybody picks a guitar up or um, or play piano that just that 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 in, have intentions of going on stage, expecting people not to pay attention to them. So the people that I see a lot of times, they go out and they do the cover circuit, and no one's paying attention to them, but they still show up. 
they get credit to me because at some point early on their heart was broken and they decided they had no way out but to continue playing uh, year in and year out to an audience that seems somewhat apathetic and sometimes the audience that, that seem apathetic are actually listening a little bit but but it's still not what it once was when they were young where people were like cheering them on I know a lot of guys who were really great players when they were younger they were the center of attention and once they got to be 39 40 they had no chance to go into another field of work but they're out there still now you know loading in like a furniture mover and setting up the furniture and they just happen to play guitar and sing and they're doing it at the end of the night they're loading that furniture out putting it in a truck and truck driving home it's it's like the loneliness of the long distance runner there's an old movie it's like they're alone and they're delivering something to get paid for but it's not as romantic as it once was in the early days when they first started off an Irish tune because I'm making a request to myself. I have direct access to the performer. I'm going to do an Irish tune. But before I have an Irish song, I have a little drink here first. Yeah, the alcohol thing with Kenny, it's, it's, it's an interesting, um, very intrinsic part of his character. I mean, it, it is who he is. Um, I don't drink a whole lot. Um, you know, I have any issues with it, but you know, I drink sometimes, I just don't do it, but um, Ken is, I mean, Ken's a stone alcoholic, that's the way it is, I mean, you can't really candy coat it. He gets drunk, I mean, that's it, the lovable drunk, the crazy drunk, so. I worry about him, <laughs> I mean, it's like he's not a young kid anymore, so it's like, he doesn't exactly consider his health on a weekly basis, I think. First of all, I don't believe in alcoholism at all. I don't. And you can, I mean, I do not believe in alcoholism. I think uh, you can't blame your central nervous system on a bad habit. That's a cop-out. You should take responsibility. Last weekend, 72 hours of drinking. I was fucked up. I did a lot of things. I didn't cop out and go, I'm an alcoholic. I'm blaming my central nervous system on some genetic disorder. No. I made a mistake. I'm the one who apologized to the club owner two days later when I sobered up. And I got that job back, you know. I believe drinking too much is a bad habit. And I do have a bad habit. Last night I was trying to come down here. I was giving somebody a ride. How in the world? Where was I last night? That was the other night. You know, all this shit blocked up. There was some kind of festivities. I guess it was the Thanksgiving parade. When I was a little buzz, I was having a problem like, figuring out where am I going to be able to get in there. <laughs> and there's cops everywhere. <laughs> you know, it's not good. It's a love-hate relationship I think he has with it. It doesn't so much turn him into a different person as, his, as much as it brings out something that is hiding in the back of his soul or in the back of his brain. There's something there that he wants to get out that he either can't or won't get out unless he's been downing quite a few. Every time I do a gig, it seems so very obby. People think I need a drink to do a better job. Suddenly I'm surrounded by drinks that are coming from the nearest lobby. What kind of job can you drink on a job when you're drinking on a job on a job? One thing that was consistent up until right now, from 21 to now, has been booze, liquor, you know. And, you know, a good 15 years, there was a lot of cocaine, a lot of pills. But by the time I was in my early 40s, I had to back off the pills and the coke. But so that, that's pretty much, uh, if you were to have a chronology of queer substance abuse, 21 to 62, pretty consistent with the hard liquor. From here to 35, you know, the cocaine, the pills, the crack, 
up to like the late 30s, you know. And then from like 45 up to now, primarily booze with occasional deliveries of the cocaine. <laughs> so there you have it. It's a, very, it's a user-friendly chronolo chronological chart for anybody who wants to, you know, imitate my life. So there you go. I'm still alive, you know. I'm not promoting it. But yeah. I'm not sure I know what for I do this to my body. My doctor says I seem okay, but my liver's rather spotty. Either way, I'm on my way and I'm heading towards the next big party. What kind of job can you drink on the job when you're drinking on the job on the job? What kind of job can you drink on the job? See how tight it goes. Try not to drink at all. You know, there's always some motherfucker wants to give me a drink, you know. And when I start, you know, to just get the, you know, I gotta have another one or whatever, you know. It ain't like the old days you know, when I always start. I'd start way before the show. And then by the time I got on the show, I was like, you know, beyond legally intoxicated. Then I had like fucking two and a half hours of shit I had to do. And the whole time drinking through those two and a half hours. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, you know, when you do a gig once a week that starts at midnight on a Tuesday night, and that gig doesn't end at two o'clock. That ends whenever it ends. When we do gigs, if he doesn't drink, we have people who are angry at him. Well, if people yell at him because they're, he's not drinking. I've actually told people I have cirrhosis of the liver. You know what their response is? Oh, one drink's not gonna hurt you, you know? I just told you I have cirrhosis of the liver. Some people who are working their nine to five jobs, they might come out and really look forward to, okay, now this is my chance to, you know, get in that room with Kenny, with other people, and we're gonna drink, and that's what's expected. For Kenny, it's like, you know, he, I, we, this is our job, every day, you know, as we go out and do gigs, you know, three, four nights a week. And what people might remember as like a really wild with night with Queter might only have been, you know, one of those nights. Yeah, he'll, he'll, he'll say to me a lot of times before we go in, I'm not drinking tonight. It's been a crazy weekend. I'm not drinking tonight. And then halfway through the gig, there'll be some old time fan. It's usually older folks who this is their, their time to party. You know, they've got their straight corporate job. But they're coming out to see Kenny this one time, and Ken's, you know, they want Ken to be the crazy Ken Queter who's swinging from the rafters. I just recently did a gig somewhere where I went into the men's room because I was trying to tune the guitar. I was playing a gig, my string broke, and it was, the band was playing. So I, there was nowhere in the, the club to, to, to tune the guitar. So I ran into the men's room. All of a sudden, everybody here's going, Queter's here! And, they, and they're going, the party's going, and everybody's dumping coke out. Like, 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 and like, I get, I'm trying to change the string, and they're like, do some coke. And I got, you know, like, I was not into doing the coke at that point. And I went to get out, and everybody's going, you fucking ass. Like, they were so mad at me. Then on the way out, somebody grabbed me. Some guy named Bob. I don't know who he was. <laughs> I don't know who these fucking people are. Everybody, like, has to grab me. And, like, you know, it's like, it's cool, and I appreciate it. But sometimes, like, the other night at Gigi, it was wonderful. But I didn't get, I was there for five hours. There wasn't six seconds that went by when someone didn't just grab my collar and I, I and then like, like, yeah, you know, it goes on and on, you know? So I can't wait till January when I slow down. That's if I make it, you know, it's like, uh, I just got to give my central nervous system a break because uh, it's all been great. I'm not complaining, but just saying like, I'm kind of old and I appreciate everybody appreciating what I'm doing, but nobody gives me one minute of space sometimes. Yeah. It's like nuts. I'm like the most un I'm like the most unknown guy in the city, but a lot of people know me or something. Yeah. There's absolutely a, a measure of truth in what you said about you know having a drink with Queter being some form of escapism because a lot of these folks. I know they have straight jobs and they work and they work and work and then I don't see them for years and when I met them they were 25 now they're 35 and the reason I haven't seen them for years is because they've been working full-time jobs and raising a family but though I'd be out at a bar and there I am bingo I've been out five nights that week and they're going dude how about a shot for the good old days I'm like, I'll probably 
I'll say, no, I'm cool. And they go, no, 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 you're having a shot with me. It's not like these people are out every night of the week like I am, because they couldn't possibly do it. I mean, but there is that, that thing where they're, they're at home, they're in bed by nine at night. They just happen to be at a bar on a Sunday afternoon with their family having burgers or whatever. And they see me in the corner playing guitar and they're going, whoa, I'm going to relive my life, my young life, because Queen is here. I'm going to have a couple of shots and act like I'm 24 again. And there's a beauty in that. But at the same time, I can't always uh, acquiesce that, uh, that generosity. Thank you. Thank you, man. Yeah. Cheers, JR. Thank you, man. Yep. Does anybody, I need a, a chaser now. Can I get like a beer or something? Those of us who care about Queter all would have to admit that you have to be concerned about some of his some of his choices. And I, I'm not you know, look, I'm not a i am not trying to be a hypocrite. I mean I've I've you know, I've I've certainly indulged too, but Ken's out there doing it all the time, man, you know. And uh and he's my friend, you know. I worry about him to an extent, you know. I do. I really do. Um. Ken had done a gig in Maniunk, uh, a place called Casa Mexicana, with myself and Mike Vogelman um, one evening. I guess it was a Saturday night. And we did an early gig, maybe 8 to 9 or something like that. And we finished up, and he asked Mike and I if we wanted to come do a party in town with him. You know, all the drinks were flowing and free and just going and going. And it turns out that that was the night that he got, you know, totally obliterated and tried to carry his speaker down the stairs and racked up his arm big time. His right hand went down and shattered his entire wrist. The hand was over here and the wrist was over there and bones were sticking out like toothpicks. They put on what's called an external fixator, which is a kind of a gruesome looking device that I don't even know if they use them anymore, that a metal cage, if you will, that gets stuck on your arm to try and uh, um, piece you back together. When I first saw the contraption that they had connected to his wrist to hold everything back together, my first thoughts were, you know, oh my God, he's never gonna play again. They told him he wasn't gonna be able to play and he was gonna to have to go through the rehab and he was gonna to have to make a very concerted effort in order to, to deal with that. Whatever type of rehab that the doctor suggested I do, I did it like 200% fold or 250% fold because without this hand, I would have probably lost 50% of Ken Queter's identity, maybe 75% of Ken Queter's identity. And if I were to lose the use of my right hand, I may not ever be able to play music again, which would make my life completely irrelevant. My doctor who had operated and put my hand back together was not at all sure that I was ever going to regain um, the majority use of my hand. He told me after it got back to 90%, he goes, I didn't want to tell you this, but I wasn't sure you were going to get more than 50% back. And he goes, I'm really happy to tell you that, that you, you know, way exceeded my uh, expectations because I've seen injuries like that and no one ever got their hand back as well as you did. I've always, I've always felt bulletproof most of my life. All, you know, I've, all, I've had like injuries, but I've always gotten past them. But any type of injury that might really permanently damage me and damage the articulation of my vision and my dream of who I am, which my hands are wrapped up in the um, manifestation of the, Ken, the, the mass hallucination of Ken Queter, um, you know, who I think I am. I don't know if I would be all that excited of being around and just being half a man, you know, I might, might have ended it. Suicide's been a friend of mine from way, way back when. When everything's get really tough like they do now and again. She always seems to show up with the sunshine on her face. Saying, if you can't take this anymore, I can take you away on a sunny day. Sunny day, sunny day, sunny day. Suicide's gonna meet me on a sunny day. Andrew, it's good to meet you. Take care of yourself. High five. High five. Let me get my hand. High five. There he is. All right. Birthday's coming up January 31st. He's an Aquarian. 
He knows an Aquarian. He's an Aquarian. All right. Take her. Drive safely. Take her. Good to meet you, Andrew. See you again soon. It's amazing, though, that he always gets himself to the gigs. He always gets himself up and going. He always knows how to take it right to the edge, and he often takes it right to the edge where you think, mm -mm, Ken's not going to be with us too much longer. And then he's fine, and then he stops. He's always got it together, you know? He's always got his place together. He's always got his ride. He's always got his employment, and, you know, he may have a headache for, for two days, but... It, <laughs> Ken drinks way more than, than, than I can conceive of a person being able to and keeps this rigorous performance schedule and keeps his life together and pays his bills and does all sorts of things that people that drink a lot less than him don't manage to do. It's a Jim Fogarty on guitar. Okay. Okay, we've got to do a couple more acoustic songs. I'm not sure what to do. It's like I've got a, a, like a large number of them. I'm thinking about doing Pandemonium. I uh, could do that. Or, or um, Cassie's Bob is a good one, too. Angel's good, too. Well, actually, they're all great. You know. Now let's not get shy here. Let's use some superlatives when my name's involved. Huh? Um, Lepke's Ballroom. Lepke's Ballroom? Want to hear that one? Okay, so well, this was written by my friend Billy Shaw. I didn't write this, but I'm gonna I'm doing it for Billy. He has a career, and that's not many people can say that. And it's not a nine to five job, it's the job he wants. He does it the way he wants it. It's he is one of the few people that have been able to create the life that he started out wanting. Based in independence and self preservation and self sufficiency. Most of the time it's like when he gets to the gig until he's leaving out of there, he's performing. Even if he's not playing his guitar, there's somebody who knows him. He just needs to be on. And I don't know, man. That's a. It's not easy. There's no retirement playing with goddamn music, so I think that's why he's turned into another really good entertainer now. Anybody who is in music that likes to play will tell you, being able to work three, four, five nights a week on a steady basis and have people want to see you and people come and see you and enjoy what you do, it's tedious, it's tiring, but he comes in ready to, to do his job. He doesn't carry his baggage on stage, you know, unless it's something that he feels might add to the show. He taught me how to be a performer. Ken's an amazing professional that way. And that kind of mutated into what he does now. Now he's a performer. He's not so much a rock star. He's a performer. Um, he does this as his job. And I think a lot of people don't get that. They expect it to be a transformative experience. And it's, it's not always that. A lot of it's just a professional, well done show. I think it's amazing that he still plays. I like yeah. anyone that yeah. makes a life out of music. That's yeah, I, I don't care what piece. Yeah, because I, I know he works He works really hard at it. And again, it's funny. It's like all the stories and the, the chaos and everything. But, you know, at, at its, uh, you know, the root of it is Ken and the and the songs and the poetry and, and then the performance because he's such a, like, you know, he's such a charismatic person. I think, to me, a success story, you know, a lot of people work on success that they need to have money or fame or some sort of notoriety. If you measure success in the number of friends that you have and the number of people that enjoy seeing you, he's probably one of the most successful people I know. If you measure it by who lives in the biggest house uh, or drives the nicest car, then he's probably not very successful. But I think perhaps what's more important is the legacy that he will leave behind. You know, he was whatever he was when he started. He's had many phases of musical career, and I think as an artist on any level, whether I was or him, the change is what's important. And if you end up, you know, unknown completely and fulfilled, that's successful. Whereas opposed to if you end up famous and empty, you failed. So I think what you start out trying to do where you, versus where you end up really determines whether it's a successful story of, of an artist. And I think Ken, who seems to still be playing and 
still trying to do it, which gives you the energy of life to get up every day, and, and people knowing who he is and people loving what he's done. I, you know, there's a lot of bands that are really famous that I don't think are that successful. Yeah, I'm, I'm just really into performing. I, I look at that as um, that, that is one uh, aspect to me that uh, it's that uh, I think I do the best. I'm, I'm the best Ken Queter that I know, you know. I know there have been imitators, uh, but uh, I'm pretty good. And I am really pretty much committed, as long as my body holds up, to continue working 250 gigs a year, you know, until I slow down. But, uh, you know, last year I did like 300, you know. So that's what I do. I don't have this like bemoaning thing, you know. I think the only thing that bemoans me is to drive home from some of these places. It's just, it's an hour drive home after three one hour sets. I'm a little tired, you know, that kind of stuff. But being on stage, I feel like just like being I'm being baptized with new energy all the time, you know. It feels beautiful, you know. In terms of a real retirement, I think I have to be physically unable to go on stage to really to pull that off. Uh, I mean, at this point, I consider myself primarily a performer, whether I'm doing Ken Quitter music or not, I, I consider myself a really good performer. Um, so unless I, if I start to lose belief in myself, I would retire, but I'd have to really be taken off stage. I'd have to like collapse or something to really retire. I'm just too addicted to it. To, like, like some people are addicted to money or drugs. I'm too addicted to being on stage. Well, I know you're soaked in sleep. But you always gonna land on your feet now, howdy I'm at the mercy of your interpreter Every time I turn around and I say to her Why don't you do it? At some point, I'm gonna have to stop. I mean, I'm getting older, you know. I mean, like, people end up stopping, you know. But I don't know when, I don't foresee that too soon. Oh, Ken will keep on playing until he drops dead. Well, the need your railroad crown our thoughts that are settling down at such a For somehow I caught some pain Puts to your park inside my brain I would much rather hang out with Queter and drink wine than go to dinner with Bono, you know? I mean, I would. I swear to God I would. He's the quintessential Philadelphia musician. Ken is a very complex person. Um, that's what makes him so wonderful. A lot of what he does, it's part of some big cosmic joke. He's one of the few people I know that are truly still doing what they want to do. He's most alive, I think, when he's doing that. That's what defines Ken Queter, I think, to Ken Queter, the playing, the performing. Kenny will probably continue to play until they pry the guitar out of his dead fingers. Then K, they both are really kind of got in my way. Oh, he is too. I thought you caught them by a surprise as I left, but nothing left in my eyes are like a secret kid. You know, what is it that makes somebody great? You know, they could be playing the same chords, sing the same songs, they could have a good voice, they could have a good. But, you know, when you see somebody that's the real deal, man, you just know it. If the idea of being on this earth is to make an impression and let people know you're here, Kenny has certainly made an impression. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to take a short break. I'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. That he left made you want to toss his coins 
flip his coins, hold his coins The way that he threw his life at you Made you only want to join You want to join, it's for free So why don't we ask him Why don't we ask him Why don't we all do a song An old melody that I learned off the telephone I heard he drives on cop car courses Testing against legitimate surrounding forces Forcing the good right out of the bed But collecting all the resources Madonna's are standing in line in the vestibule Just hoping, waiting, cursing for a little glimpse The tenants are shackled to the schools in Brooklyn But none of it amounts to that much sense The state of affairs is really lousy Can't you tell? Take a peek at the moon As we sidestep our way Through this one-way side show face, your face, that face. He's taking pandemonium, slammed it back in a place, this place.
What can I tell you about Ken Queter?